Hey, boozers and shakers, we are coming at you live. We're so excited for a fall tour. It'll be the final installment of our current Here for the Booze tour. The final, I think, 10 shows, something like that. But it's the the final countdown. uh, And we're very excited. But if you want a chance at ever seeing Here for the Booze one last time, this is it, folks, before we do our next big, big, big tour. So uh, hopefully you can make it to the next few cities. If you want to, you can check out uh, our tickets at and that's why we drink dot com slash live. We can't wait to see you there. Some shows are already sold out. So get on it quick. Bye. Surprise! We're doing an episode of M. I'm so sorry. That's my fault. I'm so sorry. I found out about 30 seconds ago we were recording an episode. Um, It was was a combination of Eva and I somehow evading telling. Like, because I told Eva we were doing an episode. I did not tell M. And then in the description of the calendar event, somehow Eva also forgot to put the episode in. But left the after chat in, which is interesting. <laughs> together, I really was under the assumption we weren't recording an episode today. But it was it was a whole hullabaloo that started with me anyway, because I we were supposed to record literally hours ago. Honestly, I think all three of us kind of conspired to make this happen. Okay. In I'll a way. take it. I mean, I'll, it's not your fault at all, at all but you I'll know. take thirty three percent of the blame and no more, no less. <laughs> no more, no less. Um, okay, well then, hey, how? Why? What's up? How do you? Why do you drink? Chris's <sighs> reaction was literally like, "Well, now I have to mentally prepare to sit here for much longer than I anticipated, and <laughs> I, I do we feel were, sorry for about that." I thought we were. Uh, do I for some reason in my head the calendar said we were doing an after chat and I was like oh maybe we forgot one from last week so I thought I was going to be here for like 10 minutes max (laughs) and now it's definitely going to be like two hours (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry my story is short today if that's my story short it doesn't I really had not too much going on so we're we're good well before anyone yells at me I want to be clear that I know I lit a candle here and I know there's a curtain (laughs) Christian. Oh, just kidding. Not even an apology. It. Just I, did, a- <laughs> I just want to move it because I want to. It's that same one that Eva got me a while ago. Um, Goodbye. It's getting down there. It's getting down there. So I'm going to put it somewhere safe fit ish. Well, um, here, I'll but- show something that I have since we're doing show and tell. Oh, great. Oh, I love show and tell. We should make a normal, a regular show, show and tell. tell. I don't know why adults don't do show and tell. I feel like we should. Maybe they, maybe we do, and it's just called podcasting. We just tell, tell, tell. <laughs> maybe, but like, feel like, like show and tell. Like when you actually finally have adult the money, fu- that's when and show and tell should be happening. Absolutely, an interest that that are yours and yours alone. Honestly, I'm gonna Wait figure a out a way to insert that into our lives. We should start a new podcast where <gasps> we show and tell. And somebody has wait. to bring a guest has to bring something and tell like wait. a story. Wait, wait, wait I'm not fun. kidding. I actually. Well, okay, we'll talk about it later. Okay, TM, but TM, I TM 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 TM. But actually, I, bet you I really that exists, I don't want to find out because then I'll get threatened by the competition. Oh my so gosh! So I think we should blindly jump in. Let's um, do it. Okay, here's my show. Just and don't tell. look up show and tell on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's about music. It's not about show and tell. Okay, but I'm not kidding. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. okay as here's my show I and tell. tell there's not oh what it, i know you've seen her before she's a babe um we just changed her lights she used to be yellow and now she's pink um but this is uh actually a fan sent this to us and it uh has dan Aykroyd, an original ghostbusters autograph on well, you gotta explain head. what it is for people who are just listening oh it is uh it's a apparently a vodka bottle a uh, vodka it's a I glass it's bottle tequila, that you hold right it says vodka. Oh, okay, never mind. But it's a crystal head. It looks like a look a skeleton it's head. A skull. It's a skull a that skeleton used to hold... head, as some people call it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and I just keep it in the old troll hole and uh, and Damn. throw some lights in there and some little string lights, little stringies, and yeah, she's she's looking glitz and glam today. You know what you could do? Speaking of fire, is put one of those corks that have like a wick in it, and then like put a little candle on top. You know, I've never heard of those. Well, Eva got me one from Morocco the first time I ever met her. And I was like, this is one of the coolest gifts I've ever gotten. Uh, I'm glad we hired you two weeks ago. Okay, Eva, listen up. I need you to go to Morocco <laughs> and I need to get one of those. Please. It's so cool. You like put it in a wine bottle and then you can like light it. But I've been too scared to light it because it's so pretty. Anyway, she is a hottie, that little skull. And I think I, so. I'm going to say she's a hottie without a body because I almost said with a body. But really, that would be inaccurate. Anatomically that would be speaking. so, so medically wrong. So she, inaccurate. 
But you know, a head's all she needs. If she had more, she'd be too powerful. That's God, the thing. she is a babe. She feels like like a like what you'd see like in a CGI like roller coaster, like it flies yeah. past you in like a haunted maze. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, anyway, she's a cutie. Um, I really upstaged you with the show and tell. Do you have anything else you'd like to show, or are we gonna let oh, me that's, just? Oh, I got something because okay. I just looked around. I'm just gonna grab something here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is a caterpillar wearing a hat. Oh, I love him. How me many too. legs does oh. he have? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh oh, he's missing one. <laughs> wow, we're both not anatomically correct with our show until today. <laughs> You're right. They're all missing body parts. <laughs> Honestly, she has enough legs though for old little Danielle over here. <laughs> okay, Danielle. Ooh. Well, I will Dan say, Aykroyd signed it. I don't oh, know. that's cute. I will say, I keep smacking this thing into the microphone. This is, um, I guess, I I don't totally remember, but at my wedding, my dad pulled this out as he gave his speech, and he put it on the table, and he said, "Oh, this is a." Uh, Christina's caterpillar toy from when she was a baby. I don't. I, I have no idea what it had to do with anything. I'm sure it's on video somewhere. Um, but then afterward, he's like, "Here you go," and I was like, uh, "Okay, thanks." Um, and so now I have Mr. Caterpillar. It's just in incredible s- condition for sitting your, in my office for being 30 years old. It's pretty solid condition. Yeah. Well, he is missing one leg, but out of oh. like, <laughs> you know, 16 or something. So you know, he's doing all right. Perfect segu into the fact that I found a website this morning that. Uh, uh, has a button down shirt, which I'm not currently in a button down phase, but we're going to get there, I think. Mm. And it has all of the foods that the hungry, hungry caterpillar. Ate. <gasps> I was just, cause I'm planning Leona's birthday and there is a theme that's hungry caterpillar and the amount of like party supplies where I was like that. <gasps> Honestly, wait, that might just be my 31st birthday. I think like, that's a way to go because I was so enamored with all the decor. The menu's already written for you. Exactly. That's you genius. You have every snack out on the table. Salami, <gasps> cupcakes, lollipops. And I'm allowed to be mean and say, I'm very hungry, hungry. So I'm this the is caterpillar. From, yeah. You eat before you get here. And I do. I eat this. <laughs> it's just on know, display for you. Leona has it in German. Do you want to know um, <gasps> what it's called in German? It's called. Well, I, the, what? Oh, go ahead. No, no. What were you going to say? I know. I know the hu- very hungry, hungry. What, how many hungries are there too? The hungry, hungry caterpillar. Um, I know Very he eventually hungry. turns into a hungry, hungry schmetterling. Look at you! Um, but I don't know what caterpillar is. Okay, raupe, which is sort of like a rope, because they're kind of like a rope. Oh, that's silly. Yeah, and so they're die raupe nimazat, die kleine raupe nimazat, the small caterpillar who's never full. <laughs> Is how they say it. Well, that is not what how they would describe me. Um, no, the, no, no. Small who's never full. I'm gonna stick with hungry, hungry. <laughs> I don't think it's hungry, hungry. I think that's the hippo. I think it's very hungry. Is that true? Am I combining them? Well, I am also a hippo, so that makes sense. <laughs> I think uh, there's there's a lot of combos happening here. Hungry, hungry caterpillar. I maybe I am it's messing it up. Definitely very hungry. Oh, the very hu- okay. Well, they should have a spinoff where there's the very hungry hippos and the hungry, hungry caterpillars. No, that seems like a dangerous. A danger zone. And it just lets you know chaos exists in all realms. Well, but, uh, we already know that. I don't need someone to remind me, but thank you. Anyway, okay. Well, hey, I'm happy to be a caterpillar and a hippo. And you can just be standing there while I eat everything on the table. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm glad You're I get welcome. to be part of this. Thank you for show and tell, Christine. That was so fun. Uh, that was fun, Em. Thank you for show and tell. Um, why do you drink this week? Or do we have time? Or are we too too far in now? Because I, I see somebody, there's a nice guy on YouTube who starts commenting um, when our stories start. <laughs> like, Honestly, I want to be offended, but it's probably it's also useful. really useful because you just click the timestamp and it jumps ahead of all this bullshit you know hurtful that people don't want to know what's going on in my personal life but i guess if they don't want to hear about it they they're not even listening to this part if that guy's uh, accurate with his timing so that's true they'll never know that it hurt my feelings yeah so, so you know why should they oh, well, care <laughs> yeah but they wouldn't even if they could i suppose but exactly. anyway thank you for that person's service uh good good job i'm sure <laughs> some people find you very practical we're very impressed so we're very thankful for your work um why i drink okay um i drink I don't know why I drink. I guess I drink because this is the last episode before my ablation. Uh, so I know I didn't want to bring it up, but I'm glad that uh, that you're getting it so soon. It's happening. 
I wonder if that guy is also commenting on YouTube, like how many times in one episode I can possibly talk about my stupid heart. I don't think there's um, enough characters on a YouTube comment <laughs> for that. <laughs> Just know that if all goes well with the surgery, I will be done talking about this soon. But well, also, we'll find something else. We'll find something else. But uh, if you don't like hearing me talk about my heart then just um give me extra energy and good vibes that i never have to talk about it again after this week so uh i'm nervous about it but fingers crossed that everything goes well why do you think i can't wait for al to text me the things that you say while you're like half sedated you know i am nervous about that i don't um, be I am more nervous about the bill. I just got it today in advance, which is nice of them to see if I want to wow, like tap kind. out. <laughs> it's like they're closer to giving me a heart attack every day. Um, yeah, but, they're just pushing you in the hospital. But uh, yeah, that, that bill's crazy, folks. So I, I pity anyone who's also having to go through an ablation for more than one reason. So. Or any sort of medical procedure. Even that birth. too. <laughs> they just don't. They don't let you. They don't let you out of there without. A, is it a true? Whopping, whopping I'm not going to. I really keep interrupting you and I'm such an asshole. I'm so sorry. No, no, go ahead. I wanted to ask without you having to drop a number, cause I'm not going to ask that of you, but is it true that the bill after having a baby is as staggeringly horrifying as I've seen on TikTok? Um, it is very high. I was very fortunate to have insurance through blaze. I don't know what it would be like under, like a past insurer. I also have very good insurance just because every eight weeks I have to get an infusion. So we just pay for the most expensive insurance to get. Got it. Okay. You know, cause it evens out, but it is staggeringly high. Yes. Staggeringly. Okay. So mm-hmm. yeah, I learned that on TikTok. I living in the States, you'd think I would just know that having a baby would be ridiculous, but then I somehow fell on to. There's always some surprise, you know? And then, I mean, <laughs> especially if you think about, oh, if you have an emergency C-section, like, then you have surgery. And it's like, Ugh. well, now you're getting billed for surgery you weren't even expecting. So it's all very shocking. Uh, but I do follow some TikTokers who talk about, uh, you know, fighting medical bills. So there there are ways to fight back on that. So if you are in that hopeless place, which I will say I have been uh, in that very scary Mm -hmm. black hole of not being able to pay medical bills um there are some ways to kind of fight back on creditors and stuff so tiktok your way out of it is what i say i'm about to tiktok my way out of it because they told me the number today and i went whoa (laughs) that Uh is a big big number yeah um okay Anyway, that is all why I drink, but I have yet to hear why you drink. Oh, I don't know. I'm just, um, I'm leaving for Missouri tomorrow. Um, Mm. I'm nervous because I'll be traveling during your procedure, which doesn't make any sense because I wouldn't be any help even at home. But that's very kind though. I don't know. I'm just getting nervous. Not nervous for you, but I'm just like, oh, I feel like, like your mother or something. I'm like, you know, should I be there? I don't know. No, you have a girlfriend and a real mother (laughs) and a real mother. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm just traveling to Missouri to visit Blaze's family. So we'll be like out on the farm for a few days. Um, are you bringing Geo? We are. And I think he's probably going to attack a horse again. So wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know a living creature who loves a farm more than that dog. That dog. And, you know, I don't know a living creature uh, more ill-equipped to live on a farm <laughs> than Geo Because the last time we took him there, he just walked into the lake. And I was like, you got to get out, bud, because you don't really know how to swim. And he kind of walked in and then was like, help me. And so I had to go in and drag him back out. Well, he's also like the size of a little, a little, I don't know, tennis ball, but he is the weight of a cannonball. So he, he will just sink right to the bottom. <laughs> he's going to hit the bottom real quick. Also, he runs right up to a horse and just screams at it, which is not helpful for anybody, <laughs> especially the horse. Um, so we got to keep an eye on that one, you know, but um, Boy. he's not cut out for the country. But uh, yeah, so I'm excited for that little mini vacation, but I will be um, on my phone and uh, making sure you're doing okay over there. Well, that's nice of you, I'll but be a I few will states closer. <laughs> oh, phew. You're welcome. <laughs> I will be uh, unresponsive, though. So even if you decide that you don't want to be invested in my recovery, <laughs> I won't know. So you are, <laughs> you're welcome to not worry too much about it. I'm ready to talk about something less stressful, hopefully, until my story. It, okay, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Just a little break. This is definitely less stressful. This is, a, I think, more of a silly story than anything. Uh, maybe maybe it's a silly story. Maybe it's not. You tell me by the end. Uh, this is episode 293, yeah? I have no idea. <laughs> I think it is. It's 
crazy amount of episodes. Yes, it is. Well, that's a lot of episodes, Anne. That's a lot of talking we've done. Shit, we're really close to 300. I know it. Uh-oh. Okay. Well, I only I checked because that was the notes I pulled up and I went, oh, have I done these before? Okay. This is the story of a cryptid and it is the Enfield monster. Oh, not to be confused uh, with the Enfield poltergeist. Okay, I did have a moment of, uh-oh, that's <laughs> way too familiar. Um, but okay, this is a different thing. Interestingly, they're only four years apart. Mm-hmm. Um, the poltergeist, the Enfield poltergeist in the UK was 1977. It was also, a uh, fun fact, the inspiration for the second Conjuring movie. Right. And I wanted to give an episode shout out to that. And that's why we drink. Um, also shout out to our episode guide, which you can find on our website. I worked very hard on that. I, I did. And it's being used right now. Okay. The Enfield and Poltergeist. And uses it more than anybody. <laughs> That's absolutely true. <laughs> I used, I, it's just a free service to others, but really it was a task I had to perform for myself. <laughs> yeah. The Enfield Poltergeist, if you want to go listen to that, was episode 56. And episode 56 makes me feel like. I was probably still figuring out how to do research. So maybe we need to cover that again in the future. Yeah, it doesn't, it sound, it's, that's probably a long time ago, like years ago. Yeah. I feel like, I don't know when we covered a QAnon, but I think that was the first time I like my skull cracked in half from trying to do an intense amount of research. Anything before that, I feel like I just like don't respect myself anymore. There's There's like PQA, pre QAnon and. Yeah. PQA, post-Q. <laughs> that's not helpful. It's the same Pre-Q, acronym. pre-Q. <laughs> Both times. So, okay. The Enfield Poltergeist, episode 56, that was in 1977 and happened in the UK. The Enfield Monster, which we're talking about today, though, was four years earlier in 1973, and it happened in Enfield, Illinois. Oh, different Enfield. Okay. Mm-hmm. But it would have been fun if there were two, oh. like, monsters duking it out in Enfield. It would have been. I would have been like, where is the movie about that? Um, so the en- the town of Enfield, which we're talking about, is very small. The most recent census said there was like 500 residents there. Oh my. Um, which is actually, I think, I think it's, the population is decreasing. I think back when this incident happened, there were 200 more people there. Really? <laughs> yeah. It's getting smaller? Oh dear. I don't know what's happening over there. I've always wanted to go to that small town, by the way, where like the population's one. Have you ever heard of that place? No it's somewhere in i think it's in the um, somewhere in the midwest it sounds like it would be in the midwest yes if you look it up like smallest population there's a town and then they did like a vice i think a vice documentary on on the town and the person was like the mayor and all this stuff that sounds like something you would do oh well you know what i would really do i know we're getting off topic folks but in california i wanted to take allison here for her birthday but it's too far out of the way but there's a town called copperopolis and the mayor is <laughs> a dog named copper I no think. i'm pretty sure i think I, I, you say at the end of that well sentence. i think his name is copper and that's why it's called copperopolis oh, but I it see. is the dog is the mayor and they have like an ice cream store named after him and they have like a whole town square and well he, like, I, I will say i did just download this is tangent number 45 in the episode already but i did just download an app of, like it's basically my old farmville days on an app um farm town i don't remember what it's called but uh i named the town geotown so you know i'm doing That's that precious and then they said oh somebody wants to be your mayor i'm like why am i not the mayor it's my farm bill <laughs> anyway i'm working on that so well um the to the town of copperopolis uh if your mayor could listen to our podcast real quick and bark if he's interested in us doing a little visit Ooh, there i would we could do a promo like an ad swap you know <gasps> i would absolutely do an get a ad, billboard like- there and talk about it here if we got a billboard in Copperopolis, if we didn't, if we did like a tourist ad, like go have a great vacation in Copperopolis, have some ice cream and pet a dog. You know that how would... Ohio keeps like advertising in LA and New York City? Have you seen yeah. those Ohio ads? Yeah. yeah. We could do that here. Well, Copper, if you're listening, hello. It's me. We love you. Your biggest fan. <laughs> um, okay. Yikes. Enfield is a super small town. And this is back in uh, 1973. This was April 25th. And there's a 10-year-old boy named Greg Garrett, and he was catching lightning bugs, which we both determined in our last after chat we call fireflies. I call them lightning bugs, actually. Oh, shit. Maybe I call them fire. Okay, whatever. You said firefly. I said lightning bug. Greg Garrett was catching. (laughs) Join Patreon for these 
this hitting, hard hitting news content. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Greg Garrett was catching fire flies slash lightning bugs uh-huh. uh, outside when he was attacked. Oh, no. In his yard by a monster. Oh, no. And here's the first silly part of it all. Attacked means somehow his shoes got ripped. Uh oh, sorry, I plugged my thing out. This, this is, is a nightmare, nightmare episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. This is folks, this is this episode is bananagrams. <laughs> I remember when I unplugged you probably all knew it before I did. I realized my computer was n- my microphone was not recording my audio, I don't think. Um so we had to pause and restart and Em was like, maybe we shouldn't be recording after all. And I think maybe the universe was trying to make that happen. And here the, we are. The cosmos. It. When I said, don't we just need to record an after chat? Oh you know what God. you should have said? Yeah. That's ding, what we should. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, I should have The said. cosmos is clearly telling us something here. Wow. So anyway, we're going to keep forcing an episode on you. That's been uh, kind of half hazardly created here in, in our, in our minds. Let's try it again. <laughs> this is what happens. I keep fidgeting and I can't sit still and I don't feel comfortable and I don't look like as well framed as you do. And I think it's making uh-huh. me all <laughs> little old <Wow>. me. <laughs> you know, to be fair, you had like 290 episodes to look better than me. And I finally have a troll. I'm hole. telling you, I feel like every time I see I'm in a new corner of my office and I'm trying to like make it look nice, but nowhere is like working for me. So I'll, I'll, I'll just stop touching everything. I think you look lovely. Thank you. Why did ESPN just email me? Oh. That was they are they should be embarrassed cuz Oh my god, I think a recruiter is reaching out to <laughs> sign you up for <laughs> for what competitive napping? Okay. <laughs> um okay, so here What are they let's... called? The Globe Trotters? That's not right. That's a basketball team. Yeah, that's what I meant. Is that what the Harlem called? Globe Trotters? Yeah, okay, that's what I meant. You could do like trampoline tricks. Oh, right. Me and my heart. You're right. You and your <laughs> broken ass body can do some <laughs> trampoline tricks. Can you imagine if like the success rate of my ablation goes from barely being <laughs> able to walk to being a Harlem Globetrotter? <laughs> medical marvel. <laughs> Crying. Oh, my God. You're a medical marvel. Also, I don't think they use trampolines, do they? Wait, yes, they do. I think they use mini trampolines. My doctor certainly will to make sure I can get on the team after the surgery. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. You were talking about something. <laughs> Jesus. I hope people really wanted like the most unhinged version <laughs> it's, of it's us. Thoroughly unhinged. Oh, okay. So there's a 10 year old kid named Greg. He's trying to catch fireflies. And all of a sudden he's attacked by mm-hmm. something in his yard. And we don't really know what attacked means because I was obviously like i said earlier um my source was newspapers.com so if it wasn't written in the newspaper in 73 (laughs) i don't really have information on it but um we don't know what attack means but there was evidence of an attack because his sneakers were ripped apart okay which like but his feet were fine so i don't uh, okay so then greg runs into his house he's inconsolable because he was just a assaulted by something that looks i think like a yeti or something whoa and his parents call the police and there is an official police report listed that <gasps> of the creature known as the monster Woo! so that's the first official sighting and then the second official sighting which becomes the most popular sighting of it all was only an hour later and it was this guy henry mcdaniel who was coming home from work and he pulls up to his house and he sees that all of the lights in his house are on <gasps> and the curtains are shut. Ew. Hate it. Hate um, it. He does have kids, the teenage kids. So he goes inside thinking it maybe they're up to something. But they run over to him screaming that something tried to break into the house. <gasps> oh, so they turn all the lights on and stuff to hide. Or, well, mm-hmm. that doesn't make sense. But they closed all the blinds to hide. They reacted the way I would. Yes. Yeah. They- yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dark is scary. Yeah, dark is scary and windows being open is a no-go. No-go for me. So the apparently this thing that had tried to break in, uh, it scratched them, or it tried scratching the door aggressively. Mm-hmm. And then it even tried to push the AC unit out from the window so that oh. it could climb in. Oh no, that's quite scary. Which also makes me feel 
I mean, there's like a lot of discourse on whether or not this was ever really encrypted or maybe there was a series of break-ins in this town. And that feels like a human move. To be like, well, I know that this comes out and leaves a gaping hole in the window. Yeah. 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 That's true. Uh, But I guess the AC unit was installed very well. Good job, Henry. Um, Good job. (laughs) Mine that is certainly a year. isn't. If anyone wants to break in, you got to climb up here. And, uh, I feel like if, if you sneeze, it's going to fall out. Um, it might. It might. So they the AC unit was installed very well, and they whatever was trying to push its way in apparently didn't do it. Mm. Uh, so they said that the break-in attempt had just happened, and the kids said their dad must have just missed the creature as he was driving home. Mm. And he might have even passed it on the road. Henry opens the door back to go back outside uh, to look around and see, you know, what he can find, if there's any evidence of whoever was there. And when he opens the door, the Enfield monster is on his doorstep. (gasps) He's back. He's back for more. And he, so this is Henry. He told uh, the Mount Vernon Register News. He said it had three legs. Kind of like that little caterpillar of yours. <laughs> it had a short body, two little short arms coming out of its breast area, and two pink eyes as big as flashlights. What the fuck? It stood four and a half to five feet tall, and it was grayish colored, and it was trying to get in the house. Okay, what? to recap, three legs. Yeah, like a tripod. For some reason, not at all what I was expecting. Every cryptid in my mind is a bipedal. Yeah. Yeah. Or at uh, least four, but three seems really odd. Three is like, was one missing? Uh, yeah, or unless you lost one. Th- did it start at three? Hmm. Um, okay, so three legs, short body, two arms coming out of its breast area, which is so freaky to me because it feels so like it's almost like, it feels like like most people's arms come out of their sides, but for it to come out of your front, I've just like it's one of those little elements that like I feel like I never hear about a cryptid and so it kind of jarred me. It feels that- like this thing was created by like Darwin's worst nightmare. Like it just didn't like it shouldn't have survived natural selection because nothing on it makes any sense. <laughs> it feels like everything's slightly off. Like I think it's it like- feels like everything's extremely far off. <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> he has giant pink eyes, three legs two arms that can't do anything to be fair the pink eyes as big as flashlights the fact that they're i'm sorry but i'm just thinking of fleshlights i'm sorry oh i'm sorry god what the frick i just think the size of flashlights and they're pink you know what i was gonna say is i was thinking of little hottie without a body or little skeleton skull over there with her little pink lights but i I did her guess i did her dirty there then i guess you did I'm if you to... don't know what the word is that I'm said, maybe let's not Google it because <laughs> there's probably a good reason you don't know what it is. Uh, you're right. But the difference is that thing has eyes like flashlights and this one has only sockets, no eyes at all. This little that's, skull friend. So I guess e- that's true. Exact opposites, I think. Great. Also five feet tall at max. So that means it was shorter probably than most people it could have ran into. Yeah. Um, so at least it's less threatening that way, but I guess it also looks wildly different. Threatening, yeah, has taken on a new meaning here. Uh, and grayish color. So that's the that's the vibe we're getting here. Okay. Henry slams the door in its face before it can get in, grabs his gun, opens the door again, and shoots at it and hits it on the first try. <gasps> when he hits this thing, it, quote, hisses like a wildcat. Uh-oh. And amazingly, in like a 50-foot span ran and hid in the shrubs within like three big steps okay i guess when you've got three legs i was gonna say like so each foot got a turn and then just like so got to the shrubs 50 feet away um so henry calls the police who can't find the monster but they do find tracks of it um after the thing that i guess ran away and when they look at the tracks it looks like dog paws but (gasps) with Instead of the normal amount of toes on it, it has six toes on the top. <gasps> so it's almost like someone put what two dog paws on? together. That's kind of the vibe I got. Okay. I actually have a picture of it if you want to see of it. Of the I'm, print or of the actual monster? The print. Oh. Bummer. If I had a picture of the actual monster, I wouldn't I know. have sat here I talking maybe about this, it. I'm telling you, I thought maybe this was like a, a hard-hitting segment where you were going to reveal for the first time. I can you imagine if I were hard hitting? Um, <laughs> no, I can't actually. Oh shit! This is actually a PDF, so I can't show you the 
thing right now. It's just, I mean, it looks like a normal footprint, but with an excessive amount of toes. Oh, that's cool. That's great. That's, that's just excellent. Thank you for sharing. The vibe we're getting here. Mm-hmm. I feel like I've said that a million times. So I you need said to... it a lot. I don't know why. Is that my new caption? Uh, uh, well, uh, Blaze says you say lore a lot. And I was like, you do? And then last episode, I realized you really do. And I was like, I never do noticed I? that. Yeah. You're like, the lore of it. You say a lot. Ah, huh, I never noticed that either. I didn't either. And then all of a sudden, I was like, oh, there it is. We're really opening a door for people to tune in. Say, and... you know what else you say? <laughs> chime in not tune in but yeah they have, all of a sudden the opinions are going to flow in mm. um okay noted i will be aware of my lures and apparently my that's the vibe we're working that's with the here. vibe we're, we're getting today <laughs> the these tracks that apparently look like normal prints but a lot of toes the best bet that the cops could come up with keep in mind we're in illinois the right. best bet they could come up with was that it was an escaped kangaroo Oh, which I've seen a kangaroo's footprint and that ain't it. So I don't know why they were guessing that hmm. random as shit animal. Maybe but, the zoo lost one or something at that point. So they assumed there was maybe one that had escaped the zoo, but there really was no evidence of a, of a kangaroo who escaped, except there was one guy who said that a year previously he had lost his kangaroo oh and oh. so it might be him but then i feel like that guy should get his own episode where we go looking for this missing kangaroo yeah, and it's sort of like why rewind. he had one yeah you shouldn't be doing that but i wonder maybe because the arms you know are kind of oh. in front of it maybe that's why they were like oh it's sort of like a kangaroo now explain the eyes <laughs> okay well the way you describe them is probably something i can never really explain but Maybe because the porch light was on and it had like weird reflective eyes. Oh, okay. Hey, yeah. I don't know. You're doing Maybe a good he job. was holding a flashlight at it and it had the creepy <laughs> eyes. Maybe he was holding two flashlights going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was holding two flashlights. Is that what you said? Honestly, oh. if a kangaroo showed up at my door and had two flashlights on its face, I would be. Uh, I, I don't think I, I I don't think any other story that ever happened to me would be funnier. I, I'm and more confusing. I'd I be meant, so confused. I meant that the dad was opening the door with a flashlight, not the kangaroo. But I really like the idea that the kangaroo showed up with either a flashlight or a flashlight. I meant maybe the dad opened the door with two flashlights, and that's why he got confused. But I don't think that makes much sense either. So. Aha, uh-huh. I see, I see. Um, mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> anyway. we had different opinions, I think, of that story. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, so Henry also confirmed for the police that was not a kangaroo uh, he saw because he had apparently been to Australia and pet one. I so love he... when people are like, <laughs> because I'm, I'm an actual expert on this, believe it or not. So he had, he said, there's no way that was a kangaroo. I saw it with my own eyes. And basically the small town agreed with Henry just because it was such a small town that they knew he would be serious about this kind of stuff. And they knew and how much he loved Australia, his trip to Australia. He, <laughs> he never made shut up about it. Those. I know. He always talked about the photos, seeing the kangaroos. So he uh, basically says this thing is not a kangaroo. Everyone in town believes him. But when the neighbors start, or when the cops start going to the neighbors to say like, hey, has anyone else seen this thing? Because this little kid saw it mm-hmm. and now Henry saw it. Any other stories? This is where they actually hear about the little kid Greg's story. So they only showed up the first time because Henry made the call to the police. And then when they're asking around, that's when Greg says, oh, I saw it an hour earlier. I get it. I get it. Okay. And when they question Greg, like to describe this thing, he adds that the monster had gray, slimy skin. Ew. Okay. Well, they got gray. Yeah. Hey, gray. And they both said short arms. Okay. So two weeks later, Henry hears dogs howling outside his house and he goes to look and he sees the monster again. (gasps) And this time he sees, he says that the monster is walking near the train tracks near his house and he didn't seem to be in a hurry. That was how he phrased the walking pattern of this thing. Interesting. Uh, This time Henry, uh, I guess reports it again and a reporter who came from Indiana who previously reported on the first sighting, uh, he comes back to town for this new second sighting that Henry's had. Okay. This guy's name is either Rick Rainbow 
or Rick Rain Bolt. Wait, which I, I know about this guy. I'm what do you I, know about this guy? I know you're thinking I'm bullshitting you, but I'm dead serious. This guy reported on an, a UFO sighting. Um, yes, he's a UFO. I think he's a UFOologist. Maybe, or he's he had a. Oh, sorry, he was a. That's not what I meant. He was a. Um, yeah, like a radio personality, and he was born, I think, as Rain Bolt, and then changed his name to Rainbow, Rick Rainbow. That makes sense because different sources had different last names. Yeah, and I know this because uh, uh, Astonishing uh, Legends tells every like fact and factoid. That's why their episodes are like six hours long. Um, and they said yes, Rick Rainbow is his real name, but I think he changed it um, t- to like you know to oh, the from I, Bolt. I really thought I was going to blow you away with this information, Sorry. and you came real hot with the oh i know him <laughs> i know him i know that guy i don't really know him but um i remember very clearly that name from astonishing legends when they talked about an, an U- a ufo and ca- or maybe it, it was some episode and they were like yeah that's his real name anyway if he's gonna be a reporter and his name is rainbow or rain bolt he really should have just stuck with meteorology like i you know maybe he tried it couldn't cut it i don't know so he brings with him, he comes back to report on the second sighting and he brings with him a big game hunter uh, to like uh, look at the tracks and do like plaster moldings and all that of these sure. animals to be able to try and figure out what the tracks were. If this it's a hun- kangaroo or not, if, I guess. <laughs> if it's a kangaroo. I hope he had kangaroo on his resume so that hun- <laughs> we knew that this hunter was serious. that means that he shot a kangaroo. Maybe that he observes... Uh, I don't He's know how to make this better. He's a very gentle poacher who doesn't <laughs> kill animals, sure. He's yeah. a very gentle killer who kills anyway. Um, he said that of when he tracked the the footprints, there was no known animal he had <gasps> heard of that had footprints dun, dun, like this. Um, and so Rick Rainbow? Rainbow? Yep. Which one are we going Rainbow. with? Rainbow. That's his like professional name. <laughs> So Rick Rainbow spoke to three locals on top of talking to Henry and these three locals, um, or he spoke to a bunch of people, but these three locals said that they also saw something strange. So there was one boy who claimed that he was trying to sleep when he saw a hairy arm come through his window (gasps) and then slip out. Ew. Another was a sawmill worker who saw a hairy creature running nearby around sunset. And like all these, I just feel like it could just be a, a hairy guy a person like, it could be a hairy person that poor guy who the sawmill worker saw running could have just been a hairy person who was on a run <laughs> yeah know? but i don't like the guy sticking his arm in the kid's window that's freaky no that one makes me think that it's like it feels more like a burglar right yeah like, or like a yes 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 so even rick and his crew uh claim to see an ape-like being but the cameraman didn't catch it in time of course it's like your only job while you're come here come on they were, however, able to catch its audio, and apparently the sound of this thing sounds like a combination of a baby laughing and a woman screaming. Good night. That's yeah. horrible. Forget it. The audio, um, uh, I think, still exists in archives, but it cannot be found online. <gasps> but, you know, next time you hear a baby crying, just scream next to it, and that's probably the sound. I already do that. <laughs> it's okay. I can just okay. have Blaze record it next time. If you're in Kentucky and you think you hear the Enfield monster, it was actually just Leona and Christine harmonizing. My bad. Sorry, the two cryptids that live under this roof combined. <laughs> <laughs> Besides uh, Rick Rainbow's team, other investigators came, and one of them was this guy, Hayden Hughes, who investigated another cryptid, which I will one day cover with certainty, because the uh, cryptid's name is the El Reno, Oklahoma Chicken Man. <laughs> Which also sounds kind of like a serial killer. Honestly, yeah. So maybe we'll (laughs) tag team that one. Uh, Okay, so back to Henry. He's getting calls from reporters nonstop. It's to a point where he actually considers moving to get away. Oh, my Uh, gosh. And on top of this, the police are now dealing with another problem in town, which is all these self-proclaimed monster hunters, a.k.a. a bunch of Midwesterners with guns. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Uh, one of the monster hunters claimed to actually see the monster and shoot at it, but then said this quote, nothing could move that fast with a bullet in it. So I guess he's admitting that he didn't uh. actually successfully shoot it. And then there's another quote. Um, or from maybe another... he's saying he did shoot it. Or he, he Maybe he's saying he did shoot it, but it like ran away and he was like, 
Yeah. That's nothing I've seen before. Yeah. It must too, be supernatural. Too fast to process. Uh, there's another monster hunter who says something similar. It ran faster than a human. It jumped higher than a human. It wasn't human. So <laughs> Ew. hate that. Um, but so things are getting wild. There are a bunch of hunters each night and to a point where parents aren't letting their kids leave the house anymore and not even because they're afraid of the Enfield monster, but because they're afraid because of getting of shot. People with guns, exactly. Just people with guns who are looking milly. Yeah, who are looking for something in the woods to move and they're just shooting at it. So that's yeah, not a good no, that's not a great move, guys. There was even uh there was one night where there were like five hunters who were getting really drunk in the woods and just started oh! shooting around and like almost hit residents in the area. Oh! So I think they got arrested. Um, but the town is, wait for it, Blaze, drowning in lore. Uh, <laughs> because tourists are now coming in to look for this monster themselves, but locals are shooting everywhere and reporters are harassing people looking for answers. The sheriff eventually threatens to arrest Henry if he doesn't stop talking about the monster oh, and emboldening, no. emboldening town fear. Okay, but it's like, it's not his fault. Exactly, which is what he said. So Henry does not back down. He says, I know what I saw. It's not my fault. You haven't found it yet. Yeah. Except here comes like the downfall of him is where the little kid, Greg, who was the other witness, mm -hmm. he comes forward and says that he made up the story. <gasps> oh, and he claims he boy. did it to tease Henry and have fun with the newsmen. But so didn't, and he's the one whose he's the shoes one who, got torn up. Uh-huh. But didn't that happen beforehand? Yeah, but he got questioned after Henry had already made a report. Okay. Okay. But, but here's his parents did call the police for some reason. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. There's uh for the believers out there of the Enfield monster, a lot of them say that ten year old Greg, uh, he they think he backed away and just like said, Oh, I didn't mean it. He was pressured into He was pressured into off. it. And it, it was either he was pressured by the town to say he made it up or maybe his parents made mm -hmm. him because they saw that Henry was getting harassed and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the whole town was falling apart because of the story. And so they were like, it's just better if you just say it didn't happen. Right. So we don't really know if that was true or not, but he's claiming that he made it up. Um, but didn't they call the police for some reason? Like mm -hmm. there was a police report. So, yeah. And that happened before. I, the other thing I think so he saw must have happened. I think he saw something and truly like, I don't think it was like this, like a monster with three legs and slimy skin, but like he maybe saw something and it freaked him out. I mean, he's 10. Yeah. He could have, he could have seen a burglar, you know, like he sure, could have, could sure, have been a person. Sure. And especially if he just kept calling it a monster, a monster, like that could be a person who was doing yeah, bad no, stuff. So you're right. Yeah. I think he saw something in, he was clearly scared enough for his parents to call the police and believe him. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. So basically, after he came forward, people stopped taking reports as seriously. And uh, shortly after this, the reports completely stopped happening or started coming through. Or the reports completely stopped coming through. And the story of the Enfield monster seemed to fade away until... This guy turned 30 because on June 3rd, 2022, almost 50 years after the last sighting, uh, an Enfield local named Zach Starrick claims to have seen the monster again. So he's oh still out there. Oh my God, your 30th birthday. And they say, I'm back, baby. I awoke the beast, apparently. You must have. Something stirred in that small town. Wow. So almost 50 years later, Zach Starr claims to have seen the monster. He was driving with his brights on and saw something run past his car when he realized that it was the monster near a ditch and then it disappeared. So that was almost 50 years later, right? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. It's 49 years 49 later. 49 years later. And Zach, I don't know. <laughs> I just wanted to throw this in. I don't totally know what the point of it is. Maybe it's to prove that like, maybe he wasn't always a believer. I don't totally understand, but he described himself um, as a rededicated God fearing Christian. Then he describes himself as a second generation cattle farmer, then a fourth generation <laughs> professional wrestler. <laughs> then <laughs> the, I can't. 
<laughs> the founder of the Southern Illinois Monster Hunters. Like, okay. All right. Okay. So I don't know what he's talking about in this Tinder profile situation, but it's a lot of information that I don't this know what Tinder to do profile. with. I feel like he got like badge merit badges for all these different things and he's just showing them <laughs> off. It's like I understand if he was saying like I'm a God fearing Christian, I don't believe in these I don't believe things. In supernatural stuff, right. But but to end so drastically differently <laughs> on really I f- quite a range. I founded the Monster Hunter Club. Like that feels like maybe... I wonder if he's just had to defend being the Monster Hunter leader for so long that he's like First and foremost, before you write me off as some Yahoo, like I am these other things as well. I'm a very I'm... <laughs> normal, relatable person in this town. Yes, I'm normal and relatable in Enfield, Illinois, as a fourth generation professional wrestler. <laughs> okay. Clear like my fathers and forefathers before me. <laughs> oh my god. Um, I can't. So anyway, he he claims that he saw this thing and he okay. actually told his story during an interview on the Rope and Radio Network, which coincidentally had just made a documentary about the Enfield monster. So I don't know if he was like, I think there's some back and forth on whether or not he was paid to say he saw it to like bring PR to the documentary. Or you could say the documentary like revamped mm-hmm. people's interest in coming forward with their stories well what they don't so, tell you is that his wrestler name is actually the enfield monster and so <laughs> he was just trying to do some promo for his saturday for appearance in the ring <laughs> okay so the last thing i have to say is that um there is a research paper in the in sociology quarterly which focused on the enfield monster and its relationship with social contagion Ooh. so social contagion is basically when situations cause a widespread group of people to rapidly unanimously develop like an intense behavior kind mm, of nowhere like a so, mob mentality group think kind of situation exactly and that can okay so, that so applies sh- to a lot of your stories i think oh yeah i think so too and i mean this it can be as vague as like fashion trends, but it can go all the way to like, there's a town oh. monster and where we all need to be nervous and shoot around, sure. shoot around um, just in case <laughs> just shoot around. Um, but what's act. So basically in this case, it would be something like the entire town going into a frenzy about the monster. But what's interesting is the researchers of, the, of this study, I think they went into it going like, Oh yeah. Social contagion is rampant here. Mm hmm. But they actually determined that social contagion was not at play here. Um, So I'm only adding this in as a fun fact of like, oh, you might think it was social contagion. But according to Sociology Quarterly, um, they sound pretty smart to me. They are no, they're not your average fourth generation professional wrestler. No, I mean, not ever, not anybody really is. So, (laughs) so they think social contagion was not involved in this because the town only cared about the sightings after the police got involved. So it was more based in human curiosity at first. Mm. Um, And despite the media storm, there was very little hysteria because I guess they define it as, well, there weren't a lot of people saying, oh, I saw it. Oh, I saw it. Oh, I saw it. There were very few reports of sightings, even though people were freaked out. And okay. so that feels like it it doesn't fall into the category of hysteria. What people might consider right. hysteria is that people were going out with their guns and shooting everything. Sure. But uh, it doesn't, I guess they don't define that as social contagion because the town seemed uh, more worried in terms of like if they were going to see the Enfield monster or if like their their kids were going to get shot like it oh, wasn't yeah. his, it wasn't hysterical enough that people were like still choosing to leave the house instead of stay safe right it just it feels like the people who were out there shooting were more like drunk locals who kind of just wanted a reason to fuck around in the woods yeah but for the most part the town was more worried about gun violence than the right. actual monster <laughs> right right and so right for that reason they don't think it was based in social contagion so i love that somebody took the time to like academically analyze this whole situation like that's fun uh but anyway that is the unfilled monster that is m good job ah thank you well hey that was a real struggle through and through today good job. i threw so many just cherry bombs grenades at you and you just <laughs> you got hit by a few but we did manage to pull through to the end and i'm really impressed by you i had a good time it was fun it was a fun little fun little ditty oh boy well i um i'm realizing it's 6 49 so i think it's high time i 
grab my box of wine real quick before I tell you my story. Is that okay? okay? Can you can you record right now, or do you need to bounce? No, I'm good to go. Uh, okay, Blaze cool. is doing bedtime. Ooh, okay, well, let me go get a, a drink, too. Okay, great. I'll see you in just a moment. Hi. Hi. What did you get? Okay, let me show you. Speaking of show and tell. So I realized this is what happens when people like you make me clean. Oh, <laughs> when did I do that to you? I just feel like you're one of those people who want, wants me to clean things. Um Okay, I want you to text Allison that because she would <laughs> laugh hysterically. I'm, I'm the messy I'm under, one in the relationship. When I'm under your supervision, I get a lot of, um, you know, because I'm a messy person. Um, and what so do you I, get? What's happening? What What do know, I do to you? In the, you were ready to murder me in the uh, space camp video because I was just kind of leaving things around. You, and, I mean. As everyone knows, you do leave a trail as I the shifter. A trail. Thank you. I do. Yeah. And so today, I, you know, I cleaned up my office, sort of. Oh. Kind of. I won't show you because it doesn't look like I did. But I did carry my dishes downstairs, which means okay. there's not a wine glass for me to drink out of. But what are you drinking out of? It's so going to be something like a, like a bowl. What it is was going to be something gross, and I did have a few options on the table. But then I remembered. That by my cricket machine, I have these wine glasses for decorating. Oh, okay. That was for making a, gifts. And so I a, found a wine glass wrapped in bubble wrap. So that was a surprisingly hinged answer you just I know, gave. No, trust me. I was very unhinged for approximately 45 seconds. I looked inside a really old coffee cup filled with coffee and oat milk. And I was like, do I just dump this out? And then, no, no, no. Oh, Christine. Been really gnarly. Oh, Christine. Well, so, I'm drinking. You know, I'm drinking squirt. Oh, I love a good squirt. Do you? I, I. That's not. That came out wrong. I meant the well, beverage. like the worst named drink, isn't it? But no, I'm trying to get into. I just keep saying this soda because I refuse to say the name. I guess I never thought about it because I only drank it when I was little, and now it's like really oh, it has a different meaning. Yeah, we didn't have this in Virginia. My neighbors, um, the Carries, they always bought squirt. Oh. I never, maybe that was in Virginia. I never saw it in Fredericksburg. I, it was it's never like it was definitely on the a table. Cincinnati thing. Oh, well, I, I got it. It was part of the, um, the Jetsons party. It's oh. leftover. So I'm trying to, it was because we did, uh, 1960s cocktail appetizers. And so oh. we did like an old school, like seven up party punch thing. Yeah. And uh, it was suggested to mix this in there. It doesn't taste that bad. I'm just getting... It's like a... It's a lemon lime. It's grapefruit. Sitch. Oh, it's grapefruit? I feel like it's maybe the West Coast. I know you just said it's in. it was in Ohio, but I'm ignoring you. And I feel like this... Cool, cool. I feel like this is like West Coast version of Fresca. Oh, because Fresca. Interesting. Yeah. I was... Yeah. I My mom was a big Fresca drinker growing up. So. I did not know Squirt was grapefruit. Okay. Me either. It was created... Oh, my God. Um, You are so smart. What? Okay. What? Did, squirt oh, what? Is, keep, keep it coming. Okay. Oh, boy. See, this is why, this is why I want to... Okay. Squirt is a caffeine-free, citrus-flavored, carbonated soft drink created in 1938 in Phoenix, Arizona. Squirt competed primarily against the Coca-Cola company's Fresca. <gasps> Shut the fuck up. I am Serious. so smart. Yeah, wow. you are. Look at me go. Uh, um, I don't like this. Enjoy a yummy squirt mixer. Ooh. <laughs> wow. That's cool. Beg to differ, squirt, but thank you. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. You know what? I always thought it was lemon lime when growing up. I never really paid attention because it was well, green. Well, look at the color scheme. Like, come yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. I know? never knew, but I really like grapefruit. So maybe I should give that a try. Hmm. It is, uh, it is growing on me. If you need to warm into it the way that I did, mm. um, the, the vintage cocktail party punch I made. If you want the, if you want to warm into it the way that I had to at the party, you just throw up one of these into a two liter of seven up and a whole bucket of rainbow sherbet and you'll be good to go <gasps> the rainbow okay that's like an old timey punch isn't it oh you just said that sorry i'm well, like yeah they used to put that in like old timey punch i think sherbet. i also don't know what's like when when it's stopping old timey because i feel like i grew up with 
it at like 90s birthday parties but that does mean that people from the 60s and 70s I think it were was like who were yeah. hosting those parties made it so i i can't tell if it's in my mind it's That's... a 90s recipe but it was made by people who grew up during 1960s and 1970s cocktail hour i wonder hour. when that became like a thing because i uh, rainbow sherbet in your punch is is definitely a thing i had growing up too me too it's delicious mm, it's it how we delicious. should all drink seven up damn okay well i'm gonna pour my box of wine directly into this glass i blew into it so hopefully there's no dust left but you know horrific the way that you do things i just like you know it's sort of like sometimes you gotta just chill out you know what i mean okay that's the thing is now having a baby too i'm like i'm glad i'm i'm pretty i'm a very anxious person but <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you laughing at did you just say I'm now that I have a baby, thank God I'm pretty or something. No. <laughs> I swear to God, the what came through into my ears was you saying, I'm so glad I'm pretty. Ah, well, let's do that. Let's let's just end at that. Um, no, I did say that, but I think I was trying to say I'm pretty chill. <laughs> and then I think I stopped myself because I realized I'm not really very chill. So I stopped at just plain pretty, but I'll take that. Like that now that take... I'm a mom, I'm just so glad I'm pretty. Thank and I'm God like... I'm so beautiful <laughs> and hot and sexy. Um, wow. I'm just glad I know how to make a party punch. I'm... <laughs> Honestly, you're one step ahead of me. <laughs> um, no, sorry. I was just going to say now that I have a baby, I'm just glad like I'm chill. I'm... I like to just kind of wing it sometimes because, you know, you don't. You don't get much chance to keep things very rigid and scheduled um, when you're when you have an infant. So I sometimes I'm like, you know, sometimes you got to just nail the curtains to the wall. Worry about it later. Okay, and that will be on a shirt next year. And and thank God I'm pretty. Also, <laughs> okay. <laughs> nail, so hang on. Step one: nail <laughs> curtains to the wall. Two: chill. Three: be pretty. Look. That's pretty. all it takes. Oh, that's all it takes. Okay. Honestly, that's my new memoir. <laughs> not my it, i had some ideas before but this is the new one new it's your your version of somehow i manage somehow i manage by nailing the curtains to the wall okay so let's see what we got for you today i think you're gonna like this one em genuinely not just like in a horrific way because hmm. this is the story of alfred packer america's favorite cannibal yeah yeah you're, you're right gonna like, you're gonna like this one you're right you know i love uh Love a good cannibal, whatever that could possibly yeah, mean. Yeah, I think you have like a sick fascination with it, as do many people, because this is not, this is not a lie. People are obsessed with this guy, like absurdly oh. obsessed with this guy. Really? Uh, yeah, like almost, he's sort of like a folk hero, almost. What? A folk, a he cannibal is a hero? I know. It's kind of weird. It's like he's, I guess it's similar to the way that somebody like a serial killer gets this kind of fan base, but... There's a little less, mm, it's hard to put, it's it's a similar idea, I think, but this guy's, I think, a lot less egregious than, like, a flat-out, like, Ted Bundy type. Oh, really? Because um, I, I have zero patience for anybody who's like, I'm in love with Ted Bundy, or yeah, yeah, obviously. kidnap me, or whatever the fuck, you know, I don't, obviously don't yeah. love that, but um, this is kind of, you know... It's kind of more wishy-washy, I guess. Like, you can tell me at the end what you think about oh, shit. this. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm ready to hear what you have to say, because I'm ready to just... You hear Cannibal? I'm ready to be fascinated, but like also so mad and angry at this person. Sickened. Yeah, you know, so I don't know. It's hard to say. I'm going to just tell you the story, and we'll see where we land by the end. Okay. Um, I think part of it also is that it happened so long ago. You know, we talk about this a lot, that it kind of softens the edges of a story when it's... Mm -hmm quote-unquote old-timey it's harder to relate to so maybe that's part of it i'm not sure yeah which is by in its own right like a pretty fucked up concept yeah, that we're like absolutely. oh well that one's fine because i feel less attached but it there is something to be said mm -hmm. about like the human mind that i think yes. this since just keeps things from hurting you as much i don't I know what so. it is it's but... sort of like a distance yeah it's like you you're i think it's human nature yeah to like mm -hmm. distance yourself from something that happened a long time ago um and not relate to it so that might be part of it well but, i am very excited to hear about a cannibal and to reiterate for the bajillionth time before someone thinks i like actually appreciate or enjoy cannibals yeah i am just fascinated at the concept and i want all the answers but i know i'll never get them and that's what keeps it fascinating to me because to even get the answers would require 
talking to someone who's done this and I don't want that to happen. I'd rather stay in the dark. Well, we did get some answers before for you and they Which were is- disturbing. And I did, I did love that episode and love in, you know, whichever way is, yeah. I, you know what I mean? But yeah. I, I did love that I finally got some answers, but I, man, I'll never have them all. And I, I'm fine with that, but I also am curious. So that's part of the intrigue. Yeah. So Alfred Packer, he has an interesting story even before the whole cannibal thing. Okay. So here's a 1984 Washington Post article uh, that was written about Alfred. I'm just going to read an excerpt. In the days before bean sprouts and granola, when the West was raw and men ate men, Packer chewed his way into the hearts of Coloradans by devouring five gold-seeking companions. What? (laughs) Also excellent (laughs) transatlantic accent, but... (laughs) Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) But still... Yeah, so that just is like a little log line of what we're getting into today. Yeah, I was going to say thank you for spoiling for us that he has a five victims yeah <laughs> so alfred packer was actually born alfred packer in 1842 near pittsburgh pennsylvania and somehow along the way he ended up alfred with the e and the r switched oh yeah that's interesting okay so his legal name appears on all historical documents and his headstone is alfred but pretty much everybody historically speaking remembers him as alfred huh Okay. And here's one fun fact tale that I like and I'm going to adopt as truth, even though it's just a theory or just speaking of lore, like maybe it's just this is just legend now. But one story goes that a tattoo artist accidentally swapped the E and the R when tattooing his name on him. Oh, and so he just ran with it. <laughs> he just rolled with it, uh, which, you know, speak of being chill, you know, I mean, at that point. Yeah, you honestly, gotta. you kind of have to uh, to avoid the shame. You have to be like, no, 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 that's my no, name. That's, yeah, that's, that's it. it. You're reading yeah. it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is no way at this point to verify the story, but tattoos were actually really common among Civil War vets because they often had their names or their regiments tattooed on themselves right. in, to, you know, in case their bodies had to be identified. Right. And so I will say in that case, it takes a lot to be chill because you're like well shit if they find me they're gonna be like who's <laughs> alfred i don't know i feel like that like your parents you have to warn them in a letter you gotta or something tell somebody yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> i switched my name a little bit right um so yeah that was a common thing to have uh that you know your name your regiment some identifying information uh tattooed onto your body in case your body was disfigured uh in battle and and needed to be identified um and he did enlist in the union army during the civil war twice uh so it's possible that he did get his name tattooed and perhaps it was written incorrectly i know he becomes a cannibal but gotta say thank i'm so far thankful that at least he was on the union i know it is always a relief when it's like well at least like at at the very least you know at least there's not two total big reasons to hate you Ooh, yeah not yet so he was eventually discharged both times for his epilepsy but he definitely had time to get a misspelled tattoo first so i'm gonna go with that story and say allegedly um okay just for my own you know fun factory yeah fun factory wait a minute it took us that this long Yikes, that is Ugh. sad on our part. Okay, I'll bring it to show and t- I'll make business cards, bring it to show and tell next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Alfred was an odd jobs kind of guy. He did just about every gig or jig you might imagine a man <laughs> doing in the 1800s, uh, including shoemaker, ranch hand, wagon teamster, wilderness guide, and miner. And then he kind of would do these and bounce around and not really stick to one career path Mm -hmm. for very long. Um, And this could have been due in part to his seizures. Uh, He, like I said, had epilepsy. Um, And some sources say he suffered several seizures a week. Uh, So I imagine that would have been tough at the time, especially when you don't really have a safety net for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But others say he was generally unreliable and just plain unpleasant. Um, Oh, You know, there's a line there where you have to think, was he disabled? And, you know, maybe like if if he had this like chronic epilepsy and was having seizures and could that have been the reason people were like, eh, he's unreliable. I don't like that guy. Right. Um, Or he's unreliable because he needs to be in bed or at home. Yes, because he's very sick. Or is it like, you know, he was actually also had (laughs) 
a shitty attitude. I don't know. Right. Um, and there's no way to know. But, you know, looking back on history, it's an interesting thought of like, maybe he really just it was struggling, you know, mm-hmm. health wise. Um, but, you know, he also has the kind of cannibal and murderer thing going for him. So, you know, we can't I'm not that sympathetic in the end about um, clearly something was wrong with his attitude or his right. uh, approach to life. Um, So in November of 1873, Alfred decided to join up with a band of Northwest prospectors on the hunt for gold and silver. Hmm. So he didn't have enough money to cover his travel provisions. So instead, he was like, I have the perfect idea. I'm going to offer my skills to you as a mountain guide and come along with you. And you'll like pay for my provisions and, and house me and stuff. Sure. So the other prospectors thought this was a great deal. So 21 men followed Alfred into the harsh Utah landscape just as an unusually harsh winter overtook the mountains. Okay. Done. 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 Um, Unfortunately, Alfred, uh, he was unreliable in in a not so great sense here because he did exaggerate his mountaineering skills. Uh, and he did exaggerate his guide skills. So once they kind of set off, they pretty quickly realized this guy had no clue what he was doing. Got it. And he's supposed to be leading 21 men through the wilderness. So this is the last time you want to realize, oh, our guide (laughs) lied about his resume. I feel like the reason it does not surprise me too much is... I mean, he already, like, accidentally got his name tattooed wrong, and he's already, like, <laughs> he's rolling with punches that people usually wouldn't. And so I feel like if I, I mean, I'm going off of one example, but I feel like he would read a map wrong and then roll with the punches. And then or just he go would, with it. Like, yeah, like, he's not, I mean, I kind of get why people are not calling him reliable currently, because yeah. I feel like it's like, oh, well, he's going to make a mistake, and maybe maybe he'll get us through it, but he is, you know. He's you not gotta gonna know what to expect from this fellow. He's not gonna dot the I's and cross the T's. Yeah. He's just we're gonna see. He's gonna. You know what he's, he's gonna do? He's gonna, he's gonna nail gonna... the curtains to the wall. He's gonna chill and he's gonna look pretty. <laughs> no, that's it. I don't like the parallels there. I was gonna say <laughs> he's gonna cross the I's and dot the T's, but yours was way funnier. <laughs> um, <laughs> glad so, I glad I redeemed myself. Thank you. <laughs> So he basically had exaggerated his guide skills, lied on the resume. The party had not packed enough provisions. And immediately, this is obviously a problem. And they are like, well, Alfred should have known we didn't have enough food to to last us this whole trip. And he didn't look at the grocery list. Supposedly, he was, you know, the expert. And he hadn't said, hey, we need a lot more provisions for this trip. Um, He said he had had experience in the Colorado high country winters and he should have noticed that this was a problem, um, but he didn't. And on top of that, he got the party lost many times um, on this adventure. And this this is like me, Em, except that I would never... T- try to tell anybody I was good at <laughs> guiding or mountaineering. You know, everything about this is me, except where I'm like, I refuse to be responsible for 21 people in the woods. Like that part, I'm stepping out, you know, for sure. um, I'm just going to be honest about my lack of handiwork and my lack of, you know, honesty is the best policy. Skills. Yeah. In this yeah. case, definitely. I never heard you say, I'm glad I'm honest. You know, <laughs> I've never said that. That's true. Just, I'm glad I'm pretty. <laughs> That's all Just, you, you know, I'm glad I can wing it at the end. The end. Um, so winter in the San Juan Mountains was obviously no joke. Um, the season could last nine months. My <gasps> nightmare uh, with the seasonal affective disorder. I would be on my butt. Uh, oh, yeah. Bad news bears for me. Um, the snow drifts could be five feet or deeper at times. And there was near constant risk of avalanches and snow blindness. And we're going to get into snow blindness later because that is. I have was going to say, I, I can venture a guess, but no, I've never looked into it. Yeah, you'll um, probably. <laughs> pun ha, intended. Ha, ha. I imagine it's like a so bad of a snowstorm that you're like, you can't see in front of you. Yeah. Like uh, fog. Not, not quite, actually. Oh, shit. Okay. But yeah, well, I know. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing. We'll get to that. 
Um, but so unlike the indigenous peoples of the region, these newcomers lacked generational knowledge of the land they were living on. So most were trying to learn survival skills on the fly. Uh-huh. Um, and this made mutual trust vital among these parties. And less experienced travelers were essentially depending on the ones who said, hey, I know what I'm doing and I've done this before. Um, and, you know, they were basically depending on more experienced guides to be honest and capable and Alfred was neither of those things. Um, uh-huh. He said he was capable, but he was lying and he was not capable. So they're all depending basically their lives on this guy. Uh, sure. And he's flat out lying. So aside from fully lying on his resume, Alfred just seemed generally menacing. Like he just was not a good well, guy there's to that have shitty attitude around. Exactly. He allegedly asked other party members, basically, how much money do you have on you right now? Just <gasps> flat out, uh, which is not the thing <laughs> you want to hear from a guy who has known money problems and has your life in his hands in the middle of the woods, right. essentially. Jeez. Oy. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Not That's the vibe we've got. Is that what you said? <laughs> so that's the vibe we're working with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a vibe we're working with. Um, worst of all, there was a rumor he'd spent time in prison under suspicion of killing his previous fur trapping partner. See ya. Okay. So what a rumor to spread through camp while you're sharing a tent with this guy. You're like, <laughs> wait, not this guy, right? Uh oh. So after several months of following Alfred's sketchy lead, the nearly starved party showed up at the Ute Tribe's winter encampment near Montrose, Colorado, where Chief Ure showed them compassion. So this is kind of a a lovely story uh, in that they were shown compassion by the local Ute Tribe, and that's spelled U-T-E, and I did watch a number of YouTube videos to make sure I was saying that correctly. Cool. Um, But so the chief, Ure, fed them and insisted they make camp and wait for spring before they continued their journey, which I thought was very heartwarming. I I really, it is heartwarming, but I really don't like that the story is so far starting with indigenous people, for some reason, welcome at a bunch of white men (laughs) and it ends with a cannibal killing five. So I'm, (laughs) I don't like the direction we're heading. Yeah, it is a danger zone. We're in a danger zone for sure. Based on history, I feel like I know where this is heading. Who's going to be victimized? We'll see. Uh-huh. Yeah. Gross. No, don't worry. The, the Ute uh, tribe is, comes out We're unscathed spared. for once in history, I think. <laughs> for okay. once in history, they're not the victims of this story. Ooh, okay. I know. What a refreshing turn of events, <laughs> by the way. It's so sad that that's not the norm in these stories, but okay. That's a relief. Yeah, exactly. So basically, the Ute uh, tribe has shown them compassion. They say, Come on. Is that what you've been doing over there? What are you making? What are you eating? I have a little peanut butter thing. Oh, I was like, you're. Do- I thought you were like, like playing with a um a Rubik's cube or something. But you were making a peanut butter sandwich. I love I, it. I was spreading peanut butter on bread. I see. Okay. Well, for, I couldn't guess what you were doing. I was, of course, I thought it was something whimsical, like playing a Rubik's cube. <laughs> it's whimsical in that I'm like filling my human belly because yeah. I'm- I mean. It I'd fall a, apart otherwise. Especially talking about cannibals. Like, you eat up before we get to that part, you know? Oh, I didn't even think about that. No, no, no you enjoy I, your peanut butter. I should have warned you, but I took one sip of this soda that I'm trying to get myself into, and I was like, ooh, I need to put food in there first. So no, you eat happened. up. You eat up, um, please. So, uh, yes, they're, they're at this tribe's, um, you know, encampment, their winter encampment near Montrose, Colorado, and... They are the tribe essentially insists that they stay um, and wait out the weather. So that's great. Um, So about half the party, only half, took Chief Ure's advice. Duh. And uh, unfortunately, a small group led by Oliver D. Lutzenheiser decided they wanted to keep going and they were going to leave the rest of the party behind. Already big mistake, I think. So they already they rejected the generational knowledge that someone yes. had just and wisdom bestowed and on them yes exactly like, they were just given everything on a silver platter and they went no i'm better i'll figure it out they were given every chance to uh rest recuperate be in safe you know well i hope safety? the tribe then found out about this and then they went well <laughs> like, good riddance you. i guess like, yeah i don't know so basically half of them said never mind we want to keep going um but <laughs> this is the wildest part it's not the wildest part, but it's one of my favorites. Alfred said to the people, the group, the Oliver D. Lutzenheiser group that was leaving, that he wanted to join them. But Oliver 
said, if you try to follow us, I'll shoot you. So he was that disliked that this other group that was leaving him behind was like, if you try to come with us, I'm going to kill you. Like, you are not invited. (laughs) You cannot sit with us. You cannot camp with us. You are out of here. You better stay here. Honestly, I don't want to see you behind us. Every person that went on that trip, though, because I'm imagining they're the ones that Mm -hmm. were also spared. Yeah. I, at least until further notice. No, you're exactly right. I feel like when they heard this Oliver guy say something like that, other, like the two other people, like the you and me in the group. Yeah. You know, the ones hiking through the tundra or whatever. <laughs> you know, the um, ones who are braving the wilderness instead of taking <laughs> the food from kind strangers. Yeah. <laughs> right. Definitely. I feel like the two, uh, the, the two people that are most like us on that trip, they heard Oliver say that to him. And then as we were walking up the rest of the hill, we were like, damn that was kind of harsh like i mean like yeah oh, like, we would have felt so guilty we would have been like bye i'm so sorry but then but then after the fact when all this news comes out we should have been like wow yeah that's what setting healthy boundaries looks like like we're Honestly, su- we survived that's, my, that's the day that i learned about setting healthy boundaries <laughs> yes no exactly you and i would have been like relieved because we were like we didn't really like that guy but also like wow that must have hurt his feelings uh-huh. um and then in hindsight, been like, wow, you actually saved our lives because you respected yourself and had boundaries. Incredible. And Oliver was like, I'm making the calls and I have a gun. So I have healthy boundaries. But next time someone bothers me, I will test out that line and be like, if you follow me, I'll shoot you. And we'll just you know, see what happens. You my know? mom said that once to somebody. And it was when they were breaking, in, <laughs> they were breaking into her car in our driveway. Uh, somebody, there was like this woman trying to break into cars on I, our street. I'm, Uh Uh-huh. Sorry. A a lot of curveballs just hit me all at once. (laughs) And my mom walked outside, saw her there and said, I have a gun and I'll shoot you. And the lady was like, okay, I'm leaving. And my mom does not have a gun. Sorry. Spoiler alert. And probably would not have done anything of the sort. But that's just the first thing that came out of her mouth. And the woman was like, okay. And she ran away. (laughs) Um, But yeah. So she's basically Oliver in this situation. She just said, if you come, if you open that car door. Um, bang bang yeah bang bang so anyway let's get back to this so oliver says if you try to follow us i will shoot you so oliver did not trust alfred or just didn't like him enough to not want him uh in the party so oliver's party set out sans is it sans sans i say sans but sans a normal person probably says sans uh sans alfred and they follow, at least they get directions from Chief Ure. He says, why don't you go this direction? This is the safest way to proceed. So they take Chief Ure's wisdom and they follow it. And a few days later, five more members of the original party left. And they didn't have quite the same boundary setting techniques. So Alfred did hitch a ride with them. And he left as their guide on the next leg of this adventure. Now, remember that there are five more members that went along with alfred on this final leg of the journey i see what's happening so also that makes me sad though that the people who chose to listen to the tribe or did they go by tribe you you, yes it's a you tribe yes okay the people who actually stayed and listened to all their wisdom are the ones who actually ended up getting like I mean, not I because of the, not because of them, but it's just like, oh man, like they actually stuck around and listened and respected to what they had to say. And, and then took, it ended exactly, up not working out. Took the advice. Well, you'll see how things shift, but you know, at least the first half did take the advice of the chief and say, you know, they suggested we take this route. And so we are going to take this route, you know? So at the very least, you know, they did follow the chief's advice as far as, uh, even though they said, Hey, maybe don't wade into this storm maybe wade it out but uh-huh. um they did at least follow his direction so they, they pick and chose they pick, pick and chose exactly exactly so <clears throat> here's where things take a turn alfred goes with these five other members on the they're kind of their last leg of this journey and chief ure was kind enough to give them supplies and basically told them you need to follow the same route that oliver took because mm. that's the safest way to proceed So Alfred pretty much immediately as they left convinced the party to break off of Chief Ure's path and climb to higher ridges far above the river because he said the snow was blown off up there by strong winds so it would be a lot easier to travel up there. So pretty immediately he disposes of the uh, advice from Chief Ure and says just kidding I have a better plan and 
you know, the five folks with him are like, well, he's the expert mountaineer. Why don't we follow Mm -hmm. his lead? And so they're kind of doomed from that moment. Got it. So one day in April, several months after they were last seen, Alfred staggered into the Los Pinos Indian Agency near Gunnison, Colorado, alone. Okay. Uh And covered in blood and other people's (laughs) body parts or something? Not quite. He was alone. And people had questions, mainly where was the rest of his party? (gasps) Yeah, where'd they go? (laughs) Where are they? He... uh, So Alfred told his sad tale. He said on their journey over the San Juans, he was stricken with terrible snow blindness. And this is what snow blindness is. It's essentially a condition caused by the sun reflecting off the snow, which can impair your vision and even cause permanent eye damage. Oh, I have heard about this. Mm -hmm. Like when you go skiing, Mm -hmm. they have you wear those goggles so that your eyes aren't, you know, because the snow is so bright. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it reflects the sun. The UV rays can be very, very strong reflecting off snow. Is this, uh, is this the story? I, I don't want to. Oh, okay, Blaze is right. There's lore. There's like, there's a. <laughs> oh my um, God. There's of a. Of course he's right. Why did we ever question him? There's a. Um, I don't know if it's real or not, but I always heard that like some people in like snowier areas had like purple eyes or something because like this or they have blue eyes but the snow hitting it makes it look like it's something about protecting their eyes from how bright the snow is their eyes eventually turn to purple it sounded fake but i've always hoped it was real you yeah i don't know that sounds like something you would have told me in third grade and i would have believed it and my mom would have said your friend's lying to you yeah okay hang on (laughs) uh photo keratitis is a Painful, temporary... Oh, it's like sunburn on your eyes? Is that what it is? Oh, ow. It's probably the sun blindness. Why does... Maybe. Maybe I'm not looking in the right spot. But I... Yeah. You know what? Someone, I think I read it on like Tumblr or something in high school and I just ran with it. But I always... It was like one of those like Photoshop like purple eyes. I just wanted purple eyes so bad and I thought that... in the way that it was translated to me on Tumblr was that people who live near the snow have purple eyes and then i was like wow i can't wait to move somewhere with a How lot of romantic snow. and then what you is moved wrong to with me? california <laughs> 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 jokes on you <laughs> okay sorry I, maybe it's it, it can't i feel like i would have heard i would have met someone with purple eyes by now right okay. i would say at least if we go to, when we go to denver or salt lake on tour you know we would have or even canada if we would have probably encountered someone by now but i'm sure our inbox is flooded with people without purple eyes being like that's not real how so. dare you yeah okay snow blindness he's got snow blindness so he is affected by this snow blindness condition um where uh the the Sun reflects off the snow and can impair your vision. And he says since he couldn't see, he fell behind and his merciless crew abandoned him in the mountains. Woe is me. Okay. Uh huh. He had to make it to Los Pinos alone and the fate of the rest of the party is unknown to him. That was and his he story. Was, and he was able to do it with no sight and By no people himself. with them. Yeah. But they, with, they couldn't make it with all eight of their eyes. Exactly. But. Yeah. Nobody knows. It would be ten eyes. Um, but you were close. Oh, right, right. <laughs> you were very close. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. So people were pretty quick, like you, to point out some issues with his story. Um, number one, there are ways to prevent snow blindness, and someone as experienced, allegedly, as Alfred would have known this and would have prepared for this. So he wouldn't have just been struck by this without any sort of warning. Number two issue is that the idea of five men leaving Alfred for dead in the mountains was pretty outrageous because in the 2006 Oxford University Press article, this is the name of the article, it's called Alfred Packer's World, colon. (laughs) We're just living in it? (laughs) (laughs) Or dying in it because he's kind of a murderer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, um, you get me. Alfred Packer's world, risk, responsibility, and the place of experience in mountain culture. I like yours better, honestly. <laughs> Alfred, but Alfred Packer's world, we're just living in it. We're just living in it and trying to keep living in it. Um, yeah. So uh, the author Diana Di Stefano explores social expectations and camaraderie among mountain communities in Alfred's time, which kind of goes into like what you were talking about maybe not but in my mind goes into it with the sociology aspect of like yeah group uh think and the sociology of groups 
um, because the way she describes it, there are countless stories of people risking their own lives to save others without any judgment, um, especially when they were kind of in these harsh conditions. It's sort of like if you don't work as a team, you die. And so there's this element of like you don't just abandon someone like this just right. would not have happened. Um, so this is a really interesting example. I already have goose cam because the story just is so bananas. Um, but this is an example of this guy named Billy Mayer. So this is from her paper mm -hmm. and it's an example of this kind of group camaraderie. So dynamite back then often got too cold to use in the mountains. So this guy, Billy would set it by the fire to thaw out oh. in the morning. Wow. So okay. we can already sense this is probably going somewhere rough. <laughs> yeah. One day he left it too long by the fire and it ignited, exploding in his face. Shit. Okay. His partner didn't know how to ski, but he put his hands in the ski's footholds, knelt on the back of each ski and crawled to get help for his friend. Oh. For his, his comrade, so to speak. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yes. Uh, it took him seven and a half hours to make it one mile for backup. Oh, my God. Which is shocking and incredible. Um, and in the end, eight more men joined the mission to save Billy and four died in an avalanche along the way. Whoa. So Billy ended up dying a few days later in the hospital and people were not upset with him for his like kind of careless dynamite habit that cost four people their lives um pretty much everyone showed up to their to his funeral and this is just kind of what you did if you were in one of these groups so wow. to quote diana's paper she said group responsibility outweighed personal culpability in oh. alfred's community if someone needed help you just help them it was simple if alfred wanted people to buy that his entire party abandoned him in the wilderness People were not just going to automatically believe that five men just abandoned him and right. left him for dead. That's just, right, right, it's right. simply at that time was not what would have happened, especially unacceptable. five. Unacceptable. Exactly. And five people doing that seemed like a kind of unbelievable story. Now, the third issue with his story is how weird Alfred is suddenly really rich. Like he just has so much money, <laughs> especially after like asking everyone, how much money for do you money? have right now? M. I didn't even put that together. Yes, he. his first question of everybody was, how much money do you have on you right now? And then yeah. he comes back to town mysteriously wealthy. Okay, I, I don't know if wealthy, but he had a lot of money. The rest of the original party who'd wisely made camp, like you had said, per Chief Ure's advice, showed up at Los Pinos that spring, and they knew about Alfred's usual money troubles. So they're like, okay, the first group, Oliver's group, so to speak, mm -hmm. who had gone the path that Chief Ure had suggested, they survived and made it back. And when they saw fucking Alf, can you imagine Oliver's like, wait, everyone else died except Alfred? <laughs> and then the two moment. of us behind Alf Oliver being like, <laughs> dude, like we did a, <gasps> oh, we were shit. so smart. To Thank leave. God we picked Oliver to lead us, you know? <laughs> You're like, Oliver, for the rest of my life, you make every call. You are my executor. You're my, <laughs> you decide, you're my life coach. You decide all of my future steps. Um, so they, so Oliver and these other guys see Alfred with all this money and they're like, hang on, you spent the first half of the trip asking us how much money we had and we knew you had all this money trouble. So where did you get that cash? Mm -hmm. Um so after several weeks under suspicion, Alfred suddenly had a new story, uh, and he actually signed a confession about this one to verify his new tale. Ah. And the ah, this is how the new tale goes. The party stayed together, so nobody abandoned him, but uh -huh. they were ill prepared for the journey, which again would be Alfred's fault because he was the one who took responsibility for being their guide. Right. And one by one, the men succumbed to starvation and the cold. The survivors were forced to cannibalize the fallen men to survive until one day only Alfred and one other man named Shannon Bell remained. Okay. Crazed with hunger, Shannon couldn't wait for Alfred to die of natural causes. So he attacked Alfred, who shot and killed him in self-defense. Uh, the woe was me hand. Really woe is me hand. Thumb down. Jeez. And he ate Shannon. So that is the newest development in uh, Alfred's story. Okay. 
Uh huh. And he signs a confession saying that uh, that that that's what happened. Now, this is an interesting twist that I think you will appreciate because this is about the kind of sociology and human understanding of cannibalism. And interestingly enough, Em, I don't know if you know this, but when Al and I were in San Diego and we did our Whaley House trip and this was like the week that you two actually met for the first time, oh. <laughs> she and I spent a couple of days in San Diego and we went to... Um, a museum in San Diego where they had this huge cannibalism exhibit. And oh, I do kind of remember you guys talking about this. I think I was trying to play it really cool in front of Allison that I didn't care at all about cannibals. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, no. for once, for <laughs> once you didn't care about cannibals because you were so enamored with Allison. Um, but yes. So we had learned quite a bit about cannibalism right before you two met, which I feel like is just the best kind of omen, you know, I'll, like I'll remind a- her later. Yeah, honestly, we had a great time. And she and I are the type where we like read every little plaque at the at the museum. I don't know if don't you do I that. know it. I I'm, know you know already, obviously. And I'm just but, like, cool, and then I leave. <laughs> yeah, no, we were just like enamored by the cannibalism stuff. But uh anyway, we'll go back someday. We'll meet you in the gift shop, I guess. Um yeah. so this is an interesting part about cannibalism. So in 2022, like to, in today's age, so to speak, people will focus on the cannibalism thing, obviously, as like the the most shocking, egregious part of the story. Sorry, my freaking Alexa keeps going off because I'd returned like 16. Hey, stop it. I returned like 16 things today. And wow. I guess it's I guess it's like dinging every time. I, I see I like the dings because it lets me know that I have presents at my door. Oh, my ring doorbell already lets me know that. So I don't oh, need her oh, to oh. tell me, you know. But um but yeah, do 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 and and Geo hates the sound so much. He just walked out with his ears like pressed against his head. He <laughs> Dude. was so upset about the sound. He <laughs> hates it, hates it. Um, anyway, so it's only done it three times and I'm like, how many more times is it going to do that fucking sound? I don't know. (laughs) Okay. Sorry. So people are going to focus nowadays on the kind of egregious part of cannibalism, but it's kind of, it was kind of different back then. So in 1874, if, if his new version of events were true, the, the new version of events that everybody died and then he had to eat them to survive. This would, he probably would have just been like a sympathetic victim of circumstance because most people back then would look past cannibalism in desperate times. Sure. Um, and fun fact for you, Em, in fact, there are no U S laws that are technically against instances of cannibalism. There's no laws against, against any- cannibalism technically. Huh. Yep. That's real funky. Isn't that weird? So, so it's like technically if you were a cannibal, you wouldn't go to jail? Well, here's the thing. There's a lot of other surrounding layers to this issue, which is that um, you wouldn't necessarily be prosecuted on the cannibalism alone. But if you had killed the person, then sure, sure be, of course, yeah, it would yeah, be yeah. the murder that would get you arrested. But if, say, you were in a desperate situation... And sure. you cannibalize someone, then like there's technically yeah. no law against that. Yeah, um, I I mean I also wouldn't judge somebody if if they were in a situation like that and had to do it. I think like the like why would I have the audacity to judge someone who clearly probably had like a had to have a mental breakdown in order to even get to that place? Like right, who's already <laughs> so, struggling enough? You know? Yeah, like if it's either eat your friend or die i think you're going through it like my opinion does not matter yeah but, well but um, that's interesting because i mean our opinion doesn't matter but like i just found it interesting that the u.s law doesn't say anything about it because no like, that's that's you know what i mean bl- blowing my mind yeah i because didn't see that our, coming. our opinions the u.s law often doesn't take into account which i take <laughs> a big issue with from the start but we'll get into that another time um but the thing that really gets me is that U.S. law is like actually that part's okay. You know, I there's there a would... lot of shit you can't do, like smoke that funny grass that comes out of the ground because <laughs> you'll go to jail for the rest of I, your life. But I feel I think like there you should be a... your friend. I feel like there should be at least one law. You know, there might be nowadays, but the 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 core of it is there is technically nothing that says in the law books that you cannot. Interesting. Yeah. 
Interesting. And, you know, huh. remember that guy who ate his own arm or his own foot or whatever? He barbecued yeah. his own foot, you know? Um, I guess there, there's just loopholes, you know? You could just kind of pull it off if you really, really, really want to. Certainly loopholes. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Yeah. So the issue here is the suspicion of murder. So if he was telling the truth, then people would be able to look past that, generally speaking. But um, the fact that five people just vanished and he's claiming this and they don't totally trust him, that's kind of where the issue lies. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) this part is like a face palm moment to me because they sent a search party in summer of 1874 to look for Alfred's companion's bodies, but Alfred led the search. Oh, what? So he could go... Oh, it's over there. Over there. Exactly. Uh, He said, I'll lead you where we were. And like, obviously, they did not find anything. Um, No luck. And so Alfred was arrested and held under suspicion of murder because that was kind of the last straw where they said, well, you claim to be a mountaineer who knew where you were. So if you can't lead us to the bodies, then we don't believe you. They arrest him, hold him under suspicion. And in August of that year, Alfred's story fully fell apart finally when somebody discovered all five of the bodies of his companions. Now, here's the details of that. I was going to say. The men were all partially eaten, as Alfred had said, and all of them were missing flesh and other pieces of their bodies, which seems to be a recurring theme here today as we discuss the skull and the caterpillar yeah. missing their <laughs> limbs. And this is just quite... They really delivered on a, on, on a theme. Yeah. They yeah. really said, show and tell who. I'm here to be the entire theme of your show. <laughs> uh, so... It's me, your aesthetic. It's me. If this is my aesthetic, like, you can just fire me now. I don't think I deserve to be in the public sphere, but it's okay. Here I am with my caterpillar. Um, So what didn't match the story, so they were eaten, which didn't match his story, but what didn't match his story is that all five bodies were together, lying in their blankets and mostly clothed as if they'd all been attacked at once in their sleep. Wow, he didn't even try to fake it. Oh, no, it wasn't. The the quote-unquote crime scene was really pretty damn obvious. There was one man's body, uh, his name is Israel Swan, that showed signs of a terrible struggle. And this did not line up with his story of they all died one by one until Shannon tried to attack him. So Alfred was officially at this point charged with murder. And things did not look good for him. So he did what any cannibal murderer would do. He mysteriously broke out of jail and disappeared for nine years okay Uh, sure you know as we would all do probably if we were able to and faced with the circumstance he came up with an alias named john schwartz and he lived under this alias for nine years until he was discovered in wyoming uh and Interestingly enough, one story goes that someone in a saloon overheard and recognized his laugh, and that's how <gasps> he was caught. Can you imagine having that distinct that's, of a that's, laugh that you someone can in- imagine it because it's you? Oh, boy! It's your little dolphin laugh, your little Elmo dolphin laugh. Yeah, I feel like I've got about a dozen laughs. I don't know which one would be the most distinct, but good that to know one. that the first one you picked is the one I will be avoiding when I go into witness protection. Honestly, if I hear that from across the bar, <laughs> it's I know it's you. I know. I would know your laugh anywhere, you know? Because oh, I make you laugh so sweet. much oh, okay. <laughs> that I'm just used to it by now. <laughs> I do wonder, like, in witness protection, do they teach you how to, like, do a different laugh? Because, like... Some of the things that come out of my throat are really just like a guttural experience. (laughs) And also like something you can't control, you know? I know. Like, how do you, I don't know what you do. I don't know. Okay. Good to know. For all the laughter, I know the Elmo one is the one I should really be the most nervous about getting caught on. Be careful. Got it. Okay. So in March of 1883, Alfred signed a second confession and he has a new story now. So this is story number three. Great. He said, I know. So buckle up. He says out, uh, that his party was exhausted, starving, and lost. Again, all of this would be his doing because he was in charge of getting them safely from one place to another. But that's besides the point. They all got too weak to continue. And after they made camp, Alfred set out alone for several hours looking for the trail to lead them to safety. When he returned to camp... 
from being such a big hero, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. He found the crazed Shannon Bell. He must not have liked this Shannon Bell guy because he's always the villain. And Shannon is tellings. somewhere up there looking down being like, what the like, fuck? What like, what the hell? <laughs> I was the only person. Yeah. I bet you. I bet you that was the one that he got along with the least because every time he's like, Shannon Bell tried to eat me. That was the one who was thinking, like, man, I should have gone with the first group. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's that, like all he of was her. clearly voicing his uh, disdain <laughs> for sticking around, and yeah. now it's like, fine, Shannon, you're going to be the crux of this whole story. Fine, Shannon, you're the cannibal now because he says he found the crazed Shannon Bell cooking flesh over a fire after having killed the other four men with a hatchet. Oh, now, uh, Alfred says that Shannon turned the hatchet on him. And in self-defense, he shot Shannon twice, killing his final travel companion. And get this, Alfred nobly waited several days before finally resorting to cannibalism. Oh, my God. But he had to do it, you know, to survive. Woe is me once again. I know it. The court did not buy it. Uh, they found it damning that Alfred changed his story twice. Uh, and Alfred was charged with the murder of Israel Swan because that was the one where they could see the defensive wounds and he was sentenced to hang. One reporter at the trial said that when Alfred heard the verdict, quote, instead of the hopeful expression he has borne all through the trial, there was a decided painful expression of sadness and resignation. He looked 10 years older than he did yesterday. Oh, However, as Colorado became an official state, there was sort of this like legislative error slash loophole in the criminal codes. And so Alfred had to be tried again. Oh. And this time he was found guilty on five counts of manslaughter and was sentenced instead of to hang. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Holy crap. OK. So wow. He got off the death penalty, got life in prison. Oh, right. Right. Uh, so during his time in prison, Alfred managed to secure a government pension as a Civil War veteran. Uh, over time, he was consistently targeted by con men, interestingly, and he did actually lose money to con men once or twice. Uh, there's one example I have here where a man uh, wanted to use Alfred to promote his business. Uh, and so he said he would connect Alfred to a man named William Anderson, who would appeal Alfred's sentence under a notion that a crime which took place on Ute territory never should have been prosecuted in the first place. So oh. basically there's this other loophole they're trying to say, which is, oh, well, this is, um, you know, indigenous land and the peop the Ute tribe owns this land. And so technically you shouldn't have even been prosecuted for this crime because it's their land. Okay. Not ours. Don't love Which, that, though, if that means anyone could just go over to their territory and hurt them and then not it's be really, prosecuted. It's really bullshit because it's saying, like, well, that's their responsibility. It's their land. And it's like, since when have you ever said that? You know? Right, right, like, right. Since right. when have we ever claimed, oh, it's not our land. So <laughs> <laughs> technically, oh. we can't. I'm sorry. We're not responsible for anything we do on it. It's like Excellent that, point, by the way. Yeah. It's just like, what a, t what a time to pull that sentence out of your ass, you know? <laughs> oh, it's not our land. At the uh -huh. 11th hour, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is uh, one of the con men anyway. So the con man reaches out, says, I know this guy who can say you're on Ute territory and that's why you should not be prosecuted. Sketchy. OK, but whatever. So they're trying to go for this loophole. William, the uh, this guy who's trying to appeal his sentence based on this kind of loophole reaches out to a woman named Polly Pry, who had apparently defended Alfred's innocence in her column in the Colorado Post. So Polly connects William to the paper's owners, whose names are Harry Tamman and Fred Bonfields. And somehow there's this big kerfuffle <laughs> between all of them. Okay. What? And William ends up shooting Harry, one of the owners of the newspaper. What? Uh, you know what he probably said first? He said, if you don't get away from me, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> if you try to follow me, you know what I'll do. Yeah. Yeah. He shoots him in his office. Like they're literally at the newspaper office and William is trying to get these head of the newspaper to like cooperate with his plan on getting this guy out of jail because they were on Ute territory. They get into a kerfuffle. Chaos ensues. William shoots 
and wounds Harry oh my and God. Fred. Both of them. Whoa. Okay, so he shoots was... Both, shoots both of them. He meant business. Okay. He was just... I don't know what he meant, but I don't think he knew what he meant. He just had a gun. He was probably looking for that fucking Enfield monster. He's like, Oof. ah, found him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So authorities brought Alfred to Denver, Colorado to testify in the case against William. So now, okay. Oh my God. It's such a headache. So now Alfred is testifying against this guy, William, Uh huh. because in Alfred's defense, William was trying to meet with the newspaper to get him out of jail. Right. I'm and with then you. shot these people. Uh-huh. And now they're saying, Alfred, you need to go on the stand and talk about your relationship with this guy. So it's very complicated. It's just a big, 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 big mess. Okay. Um, and so when authorities bring Alfred to Denver to testify, they decide to give Alfred a city tour of Denver. How oh. kind. Yeah. Apparently on this tour, Alfred does like kind of the mayoral thing and he oh. does his little wave and he's like he's like the dog at copperopolis he is like the dog at copperopolis and he takes a page out of copper's little book and he wins over every single person he meets and suddenly this is not expected the authorities take him on this tour of denver all of a sudden everybody in denver is like get this guy out of prison we love this guy oh god he just used the old schmooze still old schmooze he must be charming as all get out because there is this massive outcry for alfred's release and then they begin this aggressive petition campaign and the governor decided to commute alfred's sentence and he was released because he's a charming mofo that's freaking i mean i'm gonna say bananagrams for the third third time in this episode but ding 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 triple threat bananagrams (laughs) triple threat bananagrams Honestly, it's shocking. So basically, he got conned by this guy who said, I can get you out of jail by saying you are on Ute territory. Let me just get this newspaper involved. Oops, I shot both of them. Well, now you have to go (laughs) testify against me. Oh, but while you were touring Denver before the testimony, you uh, won everybody over and now you're out of jail. It was it's just the wildest like sequence of events. Um, So anyway, he lived the rest of his days. He's out of prison now. He lives the rest of his days on his military pension. He dies in 1907. So that was six years after he was released in Littleton, Colorado. And the Littleton Independent reported that his final words were, I'm not guilty of the charge. Okay. After all this, my guy. Which is interesting, too, because he was not in prison anymore. Right. It sort yeah, of feels like, like, like you were already cleared from that. Like, cleared. This is, like you're saying things because your your guilt is showing. You're telling on yourself. I feel like do, thou doth protest too much. You uh-huh, know, it's uh-huh. like, why well, even insist that? But now I see what you meant from the beginning of like, oh, he was seen by a as a hero. hero. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's why it was kind of murky. Because I was like, well, you know, people just seem to love this guy and like. He allegedly did some... Well, he did. He was convicted of some fucked up shit. So, you know, I don't know. Um, So the question as to why he is a folk hero, why people are still so obsessed with him. Well, there is an alleged quote from the judge in his initial trial. And I'm going to read you this quote. And I want you to know it's been a little bit um, flowered up. Oh, okay. What did you say? I thought you were going to say it's a little bit like out of date, like aged poorly oh, no. or something. It's a little bit, um, you know how they did that fun thing where they kind of embellished uh-huh. quotes and things in the newspaper. Okay. But just do it in the transatlantic accent again. Oh no, I don't know how to do that. Okay. <clears throat> this is the judge in his initial trial. <clears throat> Stand up. You voracious man eating son of a bitch. Stand up. There was seven Democrats in Hinsdale County, and you up and ate five of them. God (sighs) damn you, I sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you are dead, dead, dead as a warning against reducing the Democratic population of our state. End quote. It turns out the only thing the judge actually said was dead, 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 which is a fun little excerpt out of all of that. Still dramatic. Still dramatic. Very dramatic. The Um, other two Democrats were looking at each other like, oh, my God, we got mentioned. (laughs) I know. Like, ooh. (laughs) Uh, But so some Colorado Republicans were enraptured by this, like, false quote. Uh And 
upheld Alfred as some sort of like tongue in cheek folk hero for eating the Democrats, you know, at the time. Um, and so some of them got a little wild about it. It went a little far. This quote got pretty out of context, was not even really a quote, kind of embellished. Sure. And according to a 1984 Washington Post article, these things called Packer societies existed in 13 states. Now, um, this might be something where you go into a deep dive tonight because... I'm on it. Don't worry. You're already Googling. Packer societies in 13 states, every April, they eat dinner to commemorate Alfred's death in 1907. What? And in April 1984, the group, Friends of Alfred E. Packer, had brunch at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to tell you what was on the menu. People? Do you want to? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why? It's like a play on words, essentially. They had Bloody Marys, uh -huh. Hearts of Palm, oh. and Steak Tartare, which is raw beef. Oh, yeah. I don't want to join this, but I do want to know everything about it in case someone asks me how to join. I was going to say you were going to join it, but then I was like, deep dive on your own on the computer might be a. It's a more, more of. It'll be more of a. Did you know this is the membership application? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, there's a cafeteria, seriously, in the U.S. Department of Agriculture building, building that was once dedicated to Alfred with a plaque and all. Uh, the plaque was removed in 1977 which, by the way, was protested furiously by friends of Alfred E. Packer. That's but so according wild. to the Washington Post, their membership card displayed a photo of Alfred with the slogan, I never met a meal I didn't like. <gasps> what is wrong with this nation? Like, I, I, know, like, this, I know. How are we fighting against this? So luckily, you can still dine at University of Colorado Boulder's Alfred Packer Restaurant and Grill. It is still called that. So if you are in the area, you can still go and have a nice meal. Uh, and when it opened in 1968, students like to use a fun little slogan. Uh, they would say the catchphrase, have a friend for lunch. See ya. <laughs> See ya. Wow. And I think this is why it becomes this kind of like jokey sentiment. Like it happened so long ago and, you know, right. he was... Uh, released and i think it kind of turns into this folk story this lore sorry blaze so to speak you know where it's like well it's just a fun story even though it is rooted in reality and uh -huh. like five deaths you know yeah i'm not i don't think i'm going to contribute to any of this but i just as just as i feel about cannibalism i will want to learn everything about this like packer society but absolutely the, but finally i think i found a society i don't have the urge the to immediately be ever. a member of I, yeah. yeah it yeah. took me a lot to pull you out of rosicrucianism if you guys listen to the <laughs> rituals episode on that so i think uh i think I, maybe this is impressive i really say. do like just get tunnel vision the second i hear it, there's a society you can oh, join boy. i don't even care what it's about half the time i'm like let's go and then i'm I have like to sit down you and hear are just it all. like what's the there's a there's a secret code i'm in you know that's it all takes, i need doesn't take much it's i'm very I'm very easy to trick easy to lure into something you know <laughs> yeah. um so it, it reminds me i know that we're like way over now and i'm sorry but it reminds me of when people are kind of into the jeffrey dahmer thing and they 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 theme their kitchens after jeffrey yeah. dahmer and right or like, like buy all uh, the 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 buy all the things that are like covered in blood or like yeah oh, what's it, or like, buy the dish towels that have play on words about like eating your friend have your friend over i mean ugh, i think it's so gross something like i don't remember what it was but I, there's like also like the sexual ones it's like eat me ugh. like dahmer or something ew, 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 yeah. ew, ew. no thanks it's bad it's bad um and so it kind of reminds me of that vibe but like again like more removed just because it was yeah an like older story I hear you. I hear it. Yeah. Uh, I'm shocked I didn't hear about this person before, but maybe it's because he doesn't have the same amount of Etsy merch, you know? I mean, probably. Uh, yeah, maybe he does. To... I've just been missing it. I think let's let's not find out. I don't know. I, I don't think he does. I don't think he has the same, like, mass merchandise appeal as someone like Dahmer, you know? Unfortunately, Oy. I will say. Um, but so more than a century, this, this might sway 
the opinion a little bit. I don't, I'm not sure, but let me okay. know what you think. Okay. Because more than a century after his crime, there are still those who defend Alfred's innocence. Because in 2002, a Colorado museum examined the evidence and insisted that Alfred's story of self-defense was true. Wow. Yeah. Wow. They exhumed the bodies. Actually, they, they were able to exhume the bodies and they told experts what they already knew. Someone killed and ate the men. But whether it was Alfred or his allegedly crazed companion, Shannon Bell, is a full mystery. So it, you know, they think maybe Shannon Bell did snap and kill these people and then had a tete-a-tete with uh, Alfred and that is what happened. But I don't know. It's a little fishy to me is what I'm going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't, I guess there's no true evidence of it i don't know i still feel like if there if i don't know i don't know how i feel about it he's sketching me out you know yeah i don't Uh, feel i don't feel good about it no i don't think i want to encounter this guy well either way alfred e packer may perhaps rest in peace knowing that his memory is still beloved by many to this day whether they're politicians college students or tourism bureaus in 2017 lake city colorado where the five bodies were found hosted a festival called packer days what is going on (laughs) i'm telling you to quote celebrate survivalism backcountry skills and the pioneer spirit which i'm i argue isn't quite what was happening there right but i do i I do like the idea of it being like a survival camp or survival festival or something. That Absolutely. sounds cool. That, that part's cool and it feels very Colorado to me. The part that I don't necessarily think is something to be celebrated is that this guy basically took what the, you know, local tribe told him to do and then said, fuck that. I'm going mm-hmm. up this path. And then. And then people everyone. died, whether or not it was whether or not directly it was, exactly. his fault. Yeah, it feels a little bit like, well, that really shouldn't be what we're doing <laughs> either way, whether we're cannibals or not. But yeah. you know what? Who am I to say that? I am inside in my air conditioning, so I feel right. like it's not not for me. And em, em and I in a past life, maybe we're in Oliver's group, but I think maybe we in were our, in Alfred's group. <laughs> maybe we were in Alfred's group. <laughs> And in the next life, we said, we don't want to be outside anymore. I think so. Right. Oh, wow. Talk about a mystery, man. Talk about a mystery. And I'm sorry we kept you so long, Em, after you thought we were only doing a 10-minute after chat. (laughs) I did think by like 2.45, I would be out of here and it is past five. (laughs) Yeah, it is eight o'clock here. I am leaving in the morning for Missouri. So still got to pack. Um, But we can do our... Oh God, we cannot get it together today. We, we could do our after sync. chat. You are too. You were totally right. We should do our after chat. Okay, we're gonna do our after chat. Um, I have a fun idea for it. If you don't have anything planned, but I think you might have something planned. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, okay. 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 Well, we'll let's see you on see Patreon. If, okay, we'll see if things are planned or not. Help. Uh, and that's why we drink. <laughs> oh my God.